Welcome to the Pearson Center's webinar series, which began last April to address important current issues and bring together Canadians from across the country. My name is Francesca Iacorto, and I'm a board member of the Pearson Centre. I'm also the Senior Director of Public Affairs at the National Airlines Council of Canada. As many of you will know, the Pearson Centre is a progressive think tank that addresses the big economic and social challenges in the, of the day. In that context, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on energy affordability. Our overarching theme for 2020 and 2021 is called COVID and beyond, recognizing that we have a lot of issues to address as we plan for Canada's recovery and rebuilding that will be slow and long. This is also an important time to reimagine Canada and think big. Very briefly on the format, the panel discussion will last about 40 minutes and then be followed by a Q&A period before we end promptly at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Please use the question box on your screen and we will get to as many questions as we can. Before introducing our panel, I will take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for today. They are the Canadian Gas Association, the Canadian Electricity Association, and the Canadian Fuels Association. Thank you for your support and participation today. Your support makes uh, these webinars possible and is immensely, immense, immensely appreciated, so thank you. We have an amazing panel to address energy affordability. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep my um, introductions of these great panelists very brief. We have with us today Tim Egan, who is the President and CEO of the Canadian Gas Association. We also have with us today Kim Rudd, who is the former Member of Parliament for Northumberland Peterborough South and also served as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Also with us is Francis Bradley, who is the President and CEO of the Canadian Electricity Association, and Bob LaRock, who is the President and CEO of the Canadian Fuels Association. Our co-moderators today are James Maloney, who is currently the Member of Parliament for Etobicoke Lakeshore and serves as the Chair of the Standing Committee on Natural Resources, and Andrew Cardozo, who is the President of the Pearson Centre. So on that note, I will turn things over to, uh, to James. Over to you. Thanks uh, very much, Francesca. I appreciate this. And I, first, I want to say thanks to the Pearson Centre for uh, putting this together and uh, allowing us an opportunity to talk about that's so something that's so critical and so important. And thanks for the invitation to uh, to me to be allowed to participate in this. I'm uh, I'm glad I'm moderating because I couldn't possibly keep up with our four panelists. Um, so I'm in I'm in a safe place here because I can control the conversation and put the put the responsibility on the four of them. So um, so before we start, I just want to say to our listeners, bear with us. We're working in a techno world now because of COVID, and with that comes a certain uh, frequency of challenges. So if there's any interruptions or delays, bear with us. But listen, it's great to be uh, with the four panelists. Uh, let me start by saying that because uh, you really are uh, incredibly knowledgeable. You're leaders in the industry. Uh, we are living in a time uh, where we face so many challenges. I do, of course, want to give a particular shout out to Kim Rudd because uh, Kim is is my friend and former colleague. Kim and I uh, served together as members of parliament between 2015 and 2019. Uh, she was the parliamentary secretary, as Francesca pointed out, to the uh, Minister of Natural Resources for almost all of that time. And I was I had the good fortune of being the chair of the committee uh, and got to work with her and uh, benefit from her knowledge and hard work. So it's really good to see you. And I also got to benefit from the knowledge of the, of the, the other three panel members because uh, one of the things you do as an MP is you listen a lot and you try to learn as much as possible. And you do so by talking to people who are experts in these fields and uh, our panel members fit into that category. So enough enough of that let's jump right in we're talking about energy affordability um so let's talk about energy affordability but let's do it in the context of our current environment i mean we're we're talking virtually and that's because of covid 19 our entire world uh, in every respect has been turned upside down in the last 12 months uh people are using Zoom and other different technologies now, none of which I'd even heard of at this time last year. <laughs> um, and now I, I spend all day, every day looking into a 
computer screen as I am now and talking to other people. But it's affected, COVID has uh, exposed uh, vulnerabilities economically, uh, environmentally, uh, socially, politically. There is no aspect of our world that has been left untouched, um, including energy. Um, so we're, we're living in a situation now where people's economic reality is upside down or changed completely. Uh, but we're also living in a world where people are still very concerned about our environment and concerned about moving forward in the right direction. So in that context, in light of our new world and our continuing goals and objectives, uh, very simple question. I think it's simple um, to the four of you. What message do you have to people in that context about energy affordability? I don't know who wants to start. Um, why don't we do it alphabetically? All right, Francis, you go first. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Um, I'm delighted to, to be able to participate in this conversation. Uh, you know, my members are, are the uh, are the companies that generate, transmit, distribute. So they kind of make, move, and deliver electricity right across the country, all ten provinces, uh, all three territories. Uh, you know, during COVID-19, we've been at the front lines. Um, uh, our members have been at the front lines, supporting customers, going through, yeah, absolutely challenging times. Uh, our members have been developing programs and support in conjunction with with uh, governments and regulators, um, but looking at ways to support people and to support businesses through this pandemic. But uh, you know, COVID-19 didn't create concerns about energy affordability, but the pandemic has obviously magnified them, and it really has kind of put a put a, a, a focus on this. Our sector's always been focused on making sure we can provide that reliable, affordable power to, to Canadians. Um, but, you know, particularly now uh, in, in the COVID-19 world, we need to be laser focused on, on the customer's energy wallet as we think about the evolving economy and as we move towards this, this different energy future. But there's, uh, I think, opportunities here. Um, you know, the Canadian Institute of Climate Choices uh, came out with their report last week that identified um, opportunities uh, where Canadians could actually spend less on energy as we move forward to, uh, to a net zero 2050. Uh, but if we aren't careful, uh, if we aren't focused, and if we're, if we're not mindful, things can certainly go awry. And so, you know, in the end, I think to do so means focusing on the system as a comprehensive connect sort of connected whole, uh, not just kind of bolt on pieces. We need to be thinking of this in, in, in terms of the broader picture and as a, as a comprehensive system. All right, thanks, Francis. How about uh, Tim, you're next. Thank you, uh, James, appreciate the opportunity. And I uh, had the pleasure of appearing before you when you were chair of the Natural Resources Committee and uh, had the pleasure of uh, meeting with Kim on several occasions in, in her capacity as parliamentary secretary. So it's nice to see you both. I also thank the Pearson Center for the opportunity today. So my members, and Francis and I actually have a lot of overlapping members. My members are uh, the natural gas delivery companies across the country. And we deliver uh, just over a third of the energy um, that's consumed across the country uh, to over 7 million customers. Um, and customers overwhelmingly who are homeowners across the country and who have a particular appreciation of the value of our product, um, as most of us are enduring a rather cold February, um, uh, including here in Toronto. So affordability is front and center uh, for our customers, particularly at this time of year, um, when uh, we're consuming more natural gas than at other times. And we affordability is one of our ongoing core messages because um, as we like to say a lot, uh, we're the most affordable uh, energy source for Canadians in the home. And that affordability is fundamental to helping people pay their bills, which is front and center on the minds of so many Canadians right now. Um, you know, the, we have been weathering this uh, pandemic and the lockdowns with a lot of public support for lots and lots of Canadians. And, and, and that's been incredibly helpful to all sorts of people in need, but everybody's wondering how long that can continue and uh, when the bills are gonna come due on a host of things and how they're gonna pay those bills. Um, and so keeping things as affordable as possible is really, really critical. And energy affordability is something that every single family in Canada is thinking about. 
it's also something that every single business is thinking about. And when we talk about building back, when we talk about getting the economy back on its feet post lockdowns, what's fundamentally important to businesses is how are we going to stay competitive? Uh, and affordable energy is fundamental to that competitiveness. On your point about there also being an environmental dimension to the question, there is, there always is. Um, and uh, we take pride in the environmental performance of the of the natural gas industry, but we also recognize that governments have set some fairly aggressive targets, and we need to be um, uh, part of the conversation to help address those targets. And we put in front of your government, Mr. Maloney, about $12 billion of projects that we think are quick start projects that can help um, restart the economy very, very quickly. And it speaks to our environmental commitment but also underscores the affordability point because the more that you can build on the existing affordability base, uh, the more economically sound your recovery would be. Excellent, thanks. Um, but just don't call me Mr. Maloney. That's all I ask. <laughs> all right, uh, Bob. How about how about you? Thank you so much, James. Um, thank you also to the Pearson Center for the opportunity today to to be here. I'm very excited. Um, Yes, so I'm the uh, Canadian Fuels Association president, and our members, they uh, provide 95% uh, of the transportation fuel in Canada, be it for vehicles or marine or rail. Um, and COVID-19, I just want to put a shout out to all the frontline workers. Um, it's been a long year. Uh, you've been amazing, um, our, our people too. So uh, just keep, keep going. We can do this without you. Um, and like Tim and, and Francis was saying, affordability, um, it's it's on our mind too. I mean, we, we see it every day as we drive around our towns or communities. Uh, the price of gas is on everyone's mind. So it's extremely important for us to, uh, in our sector, to making sure that we provide reliable, secure fuel across the country. And we're very proud on, on, the, on the Canadian angle that Canadian refineries uh, do supply 95% of the fuel. So we are made in Canada solution and, and we want to keep it that way as we start to, to be building. The energy environment is a very, very uh, important for us. Um, on the fuels, we are looking at a transition. Uh, we started about a year ago. We launched a, a drive into 2050 uh, where we will see multiple fuels uh, opportunities for Canadians. And I think, like Francis was saying, the, the detail on implementation and, and how we can all do this together collaboratively is going to make a difference. And it's the, if we can do this right, we will be able to to keep the, the cost lower and, and be affordable. So we're talking, and there's so many solutions, we're talking hydrogens, which are will require transition. We're talking biofuels uh, transition and can be made in Canada using our forest or agriculture residues. You know, we're talking also LNG. Um, so Tim, it's not just also our transportation sector and gas, but it's working together, the two of us, because you have a solutions to some of our, uh, that we want to implement in Canada to lower emissions. So I think to me, what's, what's really important is that um, we work together on the multiple policies. So the climate plan announced by uh, the Liberal government, very ambitious plan, lots of moving parts. And I think we're looking forward in, in the next couple of months to really understand how it all works together so we can, we can make sure that across the supply chain, uh, Canadians can see that uh, it, it makes sense and they have options for them. Thanks, Bob. Kim, what are your thoughts? I think you may be on mute, Kim. Okay, there we go. There we go, there we go. So, um, yes, energy affordability, especially, we all know COVID is driving this bus, and it has been and it is going to be for some time now. We're not there, uh, vaccines are, are coming, they're not going to be the answer at the end of the day, there are still going to have to be measures that that happen and there is going to be, as I think uh, Tim mentioned, a long road um, out of COVID. But there's a, you know, there's an old saying, you can't go where the puck is, you have to go to where it's going. And I think that that's part of the analogy that we need to think about is we know what we have right now in terms of energy, but we know to get to 25th, net zero 2050, we're going to need a whole lot more. We to a great degree know what some of that is and what some of the the technologies, not just emerging technologies like SMRs and things like that, but but 
the in the oil and gas sector and in in um, you mentioned biomass and and wind and solar and many others there's technology movement that is changing the, the field I think from a sort of a homeowner business perspective um, we also have to recognize that the reality of climate change while we can keep to whatever degree we can energy costs as low as we can for folks and i think many governments at different levels have recognized this and they have stepped up to the plate to help in those those in um in those costs for the short term maybe a bit into the medium term but we also know that the costs of climate change are going up so while someone's energy may stay the same or maybe even go down a bit climate change is making things like insurance go up significantly so i think we have to recognize that that we can't look at this in isolation. Climate change will be a huge factor um, in how we move forward on, um, on energy in general and um, ensuring that we make our, our net zero 2050 goal. Thanks. Um, as a lead into my ne uh, the next question I have, um, you know, Francis, you started by saying we need to focus on the customer's energy wallet. And Tim, you talked about uh, a number of the programs and uh, policies that it implemented during the last uh, 12 months by different levels of government to try to help people get through it, particularly on the energy file. Bills are going to have to be paid. Look, um, those those things are really true pre-COVID. They've just taken on a different a different uh, perspective during COVID. I mean, um, all of the bills you're talking about existed before they're going to exist after people's in the short term hopefully are struggling to to pay and governments have stepped up to help them out but look we've got we've got a new government in the United States now uh, the the Biden administration's been there for four four weeks or just over a month um, overnight you saw a different tone uh, he had a stack of executive orders that was this high on his first day in office, a lot of them to do with uh, energy policy, uh, uh, one notable one, which I don't really want to talk about. Um, but uh, look, it's it's a different climate uh, politically in North America right now. But how do you, people who know me, I think come to the conclusion fairly quickly that I'm, although I belong to the one party, I'm sort of apolitical and I try to look for solutions and address issues without getting into too much political rhetoric. Unfortunately, I work in a world, Kim used to work in a world where that isn't always the case. So how do, how do we take what's going on in the United States, take what's going on in Canada, address the issues that you guys have raised and try to eliminate this uh, sort of highly charged environment? Because I honestly believe people, and I say this all the time, politically, and I believe on the energy file and on the environment file, everybody is uh, heading in the same direction. We're just going at different pace or going, taking a slightly different route. So in our current environment, sort of what what uh, should Canadians expect, do you think, but with the new Biden administration? And I ask that question knowing that it's it's uh, we're only weeks into it, so it's it's tough to say. I won't put you on this. I won't use put you on. Well, Francis, you've had your hand up again. So why don't you sure, start no, us off? Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm happy to, to kick it off because you know one of the one of the first things is is uh, you know if you you know there's there's one of the executive orders that you don't want to talk about, and I don't blame you. Um, but you know that the Canada U.S. electricity uh, Canada U.S. energy relationship is is more than just pipelines and and, and oil and gas um, that is uh, you know important and, and critical and so on but there is that the electricity relationship as well we've got 35 uh, high voltage transmission lines that that connect the two countries we've got uh, you know tightly integrated and coordinated uh, uh, regional markets I think there's some some opportunities here uh, really on, on a North American basis uh, we're broadly aligned uh, between Canada and the US on our climate objectives now with the with the Biden administration that's a, a pretty significant change uh, 
Um, and you know, and there, there's I think real opportunities to to look at moving some of those things forward. Um, and you know that the energy relationship, particularly the electricity relationship, is is important for a variety of reasons. You know, um, Canadian uh, electricity non-emitting into the United States is offsetting, um, in some cases, more expensive and uh, more uh, emitting uh, options. Uh, you know, and beyond sort of the, the reliability resilience um, we're also seeing some some benefits to expanding some of those uh, relationships and those partnerships i mean an example is is uh, you know manitoba uh, is now basically acting as a, as a battery uh, to unlock minnesota's uh, wind power uh, opportunities so you know together we can uh, i think more effectively uh, look at look at developing uh, our our resources on a North American basis. Um, you know, we we used to say uh, back in the day when the concern was just about air quality that that you know we we need to to, to look at the North American air shed. Uh, but now you know with GHG emissions we need to be thinking more from a global uh, perspective. That the, the kinds of actions that we can take that can impact that are ones that are are North American uh, in, uh, in in nature, and we now have. Presumably, uh, a uh, um, an administration in Washington that will be more open to that because one, they believe in climate change, and two, they seem to be more more open to uh, collaboration on a lot of these a lot of these issues. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Francis. Going to pick it yeah. up again. Going sure. Same order. Um, yeah, let's uh, keep the bad, same batting order. That um, you know um, the. The U.S. is on target to meet its uh, its Paris emission targets, and that's happening because of energy that's moved through pipelines. Um, it's natural gas that's enabled that, um, and it was coal to gas strategy driven by economic realities uh, that dramatically reduced U.S. emissions. And so, uh, the dare I say it, the pipeline that dare not speak its name that you made reference to. <laughs> um is it's not a natural gas pipeline it's an oil Sorry, pipeline. i put you back i put you back on mute tim <laughs> <laughs> i'll start calling you mr maloney again um <laughs> well, he didn't uh, mention it tim didn't mention it by name <laughs> True. it's uh I, I if i didn't i will the kxl pipeline because obviously it's it's of enormous import i think to the energy sector as a whole um uh not just to the to the oil industry, but to the gas industry, I'd say to the electricity industry. TC Energy is a big electricity company as well as a, as an oil and a gas company. And to Francis's point, our energy systems are remarkably integrated. You know, he made a reference to Manitoba acting as a battery uh, for the U.S. Midwest. That's that same Manitoba where over 300,000 homes heat with natural gas. Now, if they were to heat with electricity, there wouldn't be any electricity available to meet that Midwest US market. It's because of that remarkable integration of technologies that's occurring. And so when, when you ask um, how should we approach what the Biden administration is doing, I think, you know, while there's an, an initial, dare I say it, enthusiasm about like-mindedness on climate questions, I think we always have to put our interests first as Canadians and ask ourselves, how is this going to affect Canadian consumers? Um, and I think we should come back every time we think about Canada US policy to how this affects Canadians in the home. What is this doing to our competitiveness? What is this doing to our ability to deliver on fundamental value propositions that we have, one of the greatest of which is our energy resources? So I would want the constant focus to be on, okay, how is this going to affect Canadians day to day? In terms of how you position, given that very strong climate focus and, and the like-mindedness uh, on that issue, I'd say there's an enormous opportunity around technology innovation. And we need to start thinking more about where we can be strategically aligned on technology innovation, be it with respect to Bob's liquid fuels or Francis's electrons or, or the molecules uh, going through our infrastructure. And we need to think about energy systems that are delivering energy to those consumers and how we make those systems more effective. And I, I think if we do that, we can position ourselves a little better with, you know, what is always a challenging dynamic with the U.S. government. Uh, well, I, I agree with you in terms of what our approach is. I mean, sometimes the, the political dynamic isn't always just north, south, east uh, either. I mean, there's mm -hmm. political dynamics at play across this country, which, um, 
causes us to sort of trip over the issue sometimes, if I can put it delicately. Yeah. And we're seeing that uh, in very recent times on, on that uh, unspoken of issue, which frankly all governments agree on, and yet they can't seem to publicly agree on the fact that they agree. Um, anyway, Bob, over to you. Thank you so much, James. And I won't, I won't mention that one, but something else that's a lot on our minds in the short term is, is Ambridge Line 5 um, for the whole Sarnia. Um, that's another quick one. It was not part of the necessarily initial stack of papers, but that's another example where uh, by May, uh, you know, we're really hopeful that uh, we'll be able to maintain that piece of infrastructure between the two countries because uh, the supply that we need for Eastern Canada is extremely important. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's also an example on climate where the option, if that gets shut down, is, is more rail cars or more trucking, which is not better for the environment or for safety. So, uh, you know, so that's something we're keep, keeping an eye on. On, on the positive side and the, and the climate, and you're going to hear integration, James, for all of us, but it's a North American transportation market too, right? I mean, the vehicle manufacturing, the fuel efficiency standards, I think that the Biden administration is gonna come back on that and be where Canada is. Um, and the biofuel production, there's a huge opportunity for Canadian made biofuels also to be uh, exported or used in Canada. Um, but I'm like Tim too, what's good for Canadians? Like, Tim, I think for us, we're 95% Canada, and I think we want to we want to keep it that way. We want to make sure that uh, you know we produce the fuels that Canadians can rely on Canadian facilities to bring it. So whenever there's some negotiations of what's going to happen on the climate policy, I think we want to make sure that it does not uh, unintended consequences of flipping to more uh, U.S.-based type fuel, if you wish, and uh, at a detriment of Canadian uh, produced fuels. So that's something we're keeping an eye on 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 what the Biden administration is going to do. Look, you're right. I, where I live in Toronto, uh, as the crow flies, there's a railway about uh, a mile, a, a mile and a half maybe. And every single day I go walk my dog near there, there's rail cars full of fuel going by, by the hundreds. And people in this neighborhood, if you were, you know, some people who live near there don't realize what's in them and they will talk to you <clears throat> addressing the issue you're talking about. So, I mean, things like uh, Line 5 or really really important uh here in ontario uh but this is where the political messaging gets all mixed up because and i'm not saying one party's more guilty of it than the other because i think all parties are uh, like to use issues as swords but it's, it's unfortunate because the the importance of issues sometimes gets lost uh on that positive note kim i'll hand it over to you <laughs> thanks you're too kind too kind um so yeah so certainly the energy integration has been mentioned uh, in the U.S. I, when I first became parliamentary secretary, I remember being with Jim Carr and Ernie Moniz, who was the secretary of energy under uh, President Obama. And we signed a, an MOU on energy security because it is a huge issue. And the average person doesn't understand the degree, the degree to which our energy systems are integrated. And security has to be a huge piece of that. That is still a relevant document, but we have four years of, of how do I say that? A number of things that had been moved forward under the Obama administration sort of sitting on the shelf for the last four years. So I certainly think that there is an opportunity and a, a, a strong interest in reviving or bringing back some of that work that was, had already been done. And I always say to people, you know, at the political level, to Jamie's point, there's all of this noise is the best way I could say it. But on the ground level, I, I go back to the negotiation of NAFTA 2.0 while President Trump was in. And if you only watch the tweets and if you only listen to the the noise, you would think that there were roadblocks everywhere and nothing was getting done. There were something like 25 tables that were working and moving forward on it. So we have to remember that while the noise happens, there's a lot of actual work being done. And the imperative of the US um, on not just energy and enter energy integ integration and, and trade, you mentioned automotive as well, Pipelines are a huge part of that, both in terms of the, the delivery of product, but also the security of that product. And we'll remember a couple of years ago, and I may be off by a year, when the Eastern seaboard of the US almost went down 
They were about 30 minutes in that big storm from going down and it was power from Canada that was able to bring them back up. So I think there is so much opportunity here to sort of solidify those relationships and build on them. And um, I think actually in some weird way, this is kind of an exciting time for energy um, going forward. I truly believe it is. Yeah, I think, uh, Kim, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, people people don't realize how much the system, the countries are integrated, and north, south, and east, west. You remember when we studied the strategic interties uh, a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, Kim, at the committee, uh, we talked about these very issues. But you know, on the line on the line five issue, um, there's a lot of people in Ontario and everywhere saying, "What's line five now?" Who didn't sure. even know what it was. They still don't really know what it does. All of a sudden, they're hearing about it and wondering what the problem is. Um, uh, mm -hmm. my, con my concern is that rather than foc focusing on it uh, as a country and trying to achieve the outcome we all want, it's going to turn into a political problem unnecessarily. But mm -hmm. um, I'm getting a little bit repetitive here on my my, my uh distaste for partisanship if you can put it that way, if you if i can put it that way well jamie okay, so. jamie i'm just going to say very quickly that um the whole pipeline issue i there are those who are entrenched against pipelines and and we're not going to move them but there are a whole bunch of folks in this country who really don't understand the difference pipelines make in terms of our environment in terms of our security in terms of our economic um, prosperity as a country in terms of our export. I mean, our our oil and gas, a lot of it's going to the US. That's export dollars back to Canada. So I think we also in the energy space have a job to do about helping people understand what they really are. Agreed, agreed. Okay, now the question, the uh, really, really, really big question. I know uh, <laughs> Kim will agree with me that uh, Governments pay close attention to the energy sector when it comes time to make policy decisions, and particularly when they're leading up to uh, introducing budgets and considering new measures. Uh, given the significance of the time we are in right now, this budget that's uh, upcoming, which whenever that may be, uh, is of critical importance. And to all of you, uh, that all the people and groups that you represent, uh, maybe more not no more important time there is now um so simple question uh and i know you've already had discussions of whatnot but what do you want to see in the budget if you could give me a a a, a, li a wish list that i could hang up from this call call the finance minister and provide to her what would be on it uh, particularly in light of uh, our current environment and our uh, plans to achieve net zero who, who wants, Francis? I noticed your hands not rushing up this time. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay, good. Cool. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Sure. Then, yeah, if it's the same, the same, the same cycle. Then, then Kim gets the bat cleanup once again. And, That's right. <laughs> My favorite. This is, you know, what, what we're looking for more than anything else is some certainty and some movement on many of the things uh, that the government has, has already announced, but 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 hasn't moved forward on. You know, for example, in the fall. The government announced the down payment on recovery, but like, what, is, what does that mean and what does that bring? We've got some specific priorities, uh, not terribly surprising. As a you know, general comment, we, we wanna see investments to help uh, build that, that, you know, that durable, reliable electricity grid. Um, and what does that mean? That means, you know, what, what can the government do to uh, reduce barriers, to, to uh, help enable some of those investments? Um, one of the big pieces is a comprehensive electrification strategy. But we don't, you know, this is something we've been talking about for a long time. We basically need a plan, something that connects all of the pieces uh, and connects them to make sure that that, that we uh, then understand the framework within which those investments are going to be made. It needs to, you know, uh, recognize the difference in different uh, different regions uh, and so on, but it, it needs to pull all of those uh, things together. Um, some of the other specifics, we need to continue, continue advancing emerging technologies like uh, energy storage, small modular reactors reactors, hydrogen, uh, absolutely uh, high on our list. Um, how can we create regulations and rules that facilitate uh, innovation and technologies because we're not there? 
Um, some of it's red tape, but it's also you know a question of updating some of the rules. It, things as as that may seem mundane like metering rules, but but those are some of the things that are that are standing in the way of of a you know a more rapid rollout, for example, of electric vehicles and electrification of transportation. Uh, and finally, um, I mean, James, I. I, I always mention cybersecurity and I've got to mention cybersecurity in, in this context too because it continues to be a, a huge issue where you know we've seen uh, a, a pretty massive uh, cyber event that mainly uh, was affecting Americans but you know in some cases they were affecting Canadians this, this past month. Um, we have a, a project that we've seen uh, rolled out here in Canada a couple of years ago called Project Lighthouse that was just in one jurisdiction we talked about can we see this rolling out uh, more broadly across the country and into other sectors. And, you know, TIMS is a, is, a, is a sector. We've been sharing everything we know in this space with TIMS Association, and and, uh, and, and that would be also a natural for looking at expanding uh, these kinds of cyber protections. But there, that would be my, uh, my short list, James. Thanks. All right, thanks. All right, Tim, how about you? Well, James, I, I, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, we put out a public document earlier in the year with a whole list of projects that we described as shovel-ready projects. <laughs> those, are, those are still in front of the government. Um, uh, we're hoping the government will take note of those because we think they're, they're early actions that can be taken that can help drive quick ec economic recovery. I, I then agree with Francis on a series of his points. I mean, we're, we're working incredibly closely um across the industry on cybersecurity, on measurement questions measurements an issue that affects the three associations you've got before you today um and on the technology stuff as well um but i guess if there's one message i would want to leave and here's where i'll, I'll disagree with francis he he talked about electrification and electrification needless to say is kind of a bad word in my industry um uh not that well, we're i wondered if you were going to say that <laughs> Not that we're we're opposed to any technological innovation that that continues to drive advancements in terms of efficiency and environmental performance and affordability and reliability. We are, and in some instances, I think that will and that will mean electrification. But what we want to make sure is that government recognizes that there are several different pathways to delivering your objectives, and you shouldn't pick one. Correct. You should put the conditions in place so that any pathway is open and then innovation can come in and so you know there's going to be innovation with respect to liquid fuels and all the stuff that bob and his folks are doing there's going to be innovation with respect to electricity and all the stuff that francis and his folks are doing and there's going to be innovation on uh on the natural gas delivery system through our infrastructure and you know we can move a variety of fuels i remember having a conversation with uh with some of your colleagues uh, about this point, that don't assume that the only way to move renewables is over wires, a renewable energy that is. Uh, you can be moving it through liquid fuels, you can be moving it through gaseous fuels. So the, there's, if, if there's a, a cautionary message, I would say it is, please don't pick a pathway, because when governments pick a pathway, it rarely goes well. Um, so put the conditions in place that industry can step forward and Canadians can demonstrate how creative and entrepreneurial they are, over a host of pathways. I hear you. All right, Bob, over to you. I, James, I got to repeat it. Multiple fuels, please do not just pick one pathway. Tim, I'm like you, electrification, cars, it will have its place, but it's not the only solution. There's multiple solution there that we need to, to look into. So we're looking for, for that kind of in the budget. It's not just one sector or one solution on the climate that would you know would be getting significant i think is is a room for everyone um second point james i want to make i'm like francis on this one a lot of announcements in december in the climate plan the low carbon fuel plan the uh, accelerator fund those are all great announcement but if we can start the implementation shortly um, because we need to get going and i think it's an example where we if we can put those investments tim i'm like you also there was a $875 million announcement uh, in Montreal, for example, with Shell and Suncor and NRCAM. We can do more of those, James, so we're looking for the implementation to happen. One more thing, I think that it's the collaboration. Um, Francis, you talked about electrification strategy. We're looking for a transportation 
um, strategy, if you wish, uh, with the, the vehicle manufacturers, uh, because of all the multiple fuels, the, multi the infrastructure we have, James, is so clear and important. All the way from the refining to terminals and old cell, card lock stations, all the way to 12, 15,000 gas stations across the country. I think we have an opportunity to leverage what we have and build back better in Canada to meet our, our future plans, both on energy and, and the environment. And lastly, what I think, it's not necessarily a huge budget ask, but I think, Kim, you mentioned it. And I, Tim, you and I have talked about it before too. It's, it's providing more information to consumers. We're going to a transition, but I don't think the consumers is, like we're saying, they're not totally aware with line five. They're not aware of what, if I purchase a car in five years, what kind of fuel am I gonna be able to put in it? What, what are my options with LNG or charging and all that? And I think, and especially in my world, we need to do a better job to bring in Canadians with us on this transition so everyone is well informed. So we're looking for some kind of an education or something there that we can all do together. Um, and part of our transportation task force, if you want, would be to do, to do something like that. Great, thanks. Okay, Kim, last word to you on this. Okay, a couple of things. One, money out the door, absolutely. Um, I know it's one of the, the biggest frustrations. Um, things haven't changed, except maybe it is a bit slower. And, and I will, you know, say that maybe COVID is, is the reason. Because as I said, it's, it is driving the whole bus right now. I'll, I'll say a couple of things about, um, you know, Tim, you talked about, um, sort of, in your remarks, you talked about what we have now and what we can do. And I think that that is so important. I think we have to recognize it's not, it's not one or the other, it's all of the above. It has to be all of the above. I think of what, um, what will we have been, things have been like 20 years ago when solar and wind first came on, on the market and people said, no, we can't have those. They're too expensive, they won't be competitive there's just no market for that and government subsidize them rightly or wrongly to get them going and look where we are now they are a huge part of our our electricity system and they service areas that that um uh help our clean electricity grid first of a kind is always challenging and to make 2050 we know we need first of a kind and i'm going back to the nuclear um uh, we, uh, Francis mentioned SMRs, and of course that was my file the whole time I was uh, the parliamentary secretary, and I'm still engaged. And the government has clearly said it has to be part of the solution in order to get to 2050. The IEA says we won't get there without nuclear and SMRs, but it's not them exclusively. That's the point. It is their ability to coexist and generate with wind and solar, with biomass. It is their ability to go to small northern remote communities where right now they're burning diesel. Um, there are a whole bunch of, of, I mean, the list is long and I won't go into them and I, I think we all know that. The, the reality is we have to stop thinking about a this or a that. We have to think about what the whole suite of options are and figure out in this huge geographically vast and um, country what fits better where and who can work together and how we do it. And when we talk about transition, I think people get a little bit ahead of themselves. When they think transition, we're going to transition away from fossil fuels, people talk about. We're going to transition. We're, we're finding all sorts of um, mechanisms to reduce GHG emissions from the oil sands is an example. They've gone down 25%. Nobody knows that. We're, we're making polypropylene now in Canada. We have two plants. We didn't have that. We were buying it from China. And what's the GHG emissions attached to bring that product from China? And now we have a made in Canada solution. So I'm going back to where I kind of started and said, we have a responsibility to help people understand how robust and flexible we are and how we need to work together and can work together to get we, where we need to go. So my request from the government is that when you want clean energy, when, when we have said clearly we need clean energy, you have to support those new innovations as well as new innovations in the current mix that we have. It's not one or the other, it has to be both. And if I could just uh, uh, add, sure, James, go ahead. That uh, you know, the, I, I think we actually um, agree more than more than it may seem. Um, I you know I absolutely agree that you know we're looking at a world where there's multiple pathways uh, to to get to where we're going to wind up. 
Uh, and the pathways will be different depending upon the region that you're in and depending upon the resources that you have available within the pathways. And so, um, you know, I'm not suggesting that there is only one pathway, um, but I work for the Electricity Association, so I'm talking about electrification. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, you know, it, it is, you know, the degree to which that pathway is going to be important and significant. And it will vary by region in terms of what that what that actually looks like. But, you know, you know, back to, to your point, Tim, there are multiple pathways. And indeed, <clears throat> probably the most interesting thing I found coming out of the work uh, from the, the Center on, on uh, the Institute on Climate Cho Choices was uh, was the fact that they have a multitude of pathways that bring us uh, to 2050. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're suggesting as well that the future will probably be a combination of a number of those different pathways and they will look different regionally. Listen, I, okay, this, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Andrew in a second because I know there's some questions from the audience, but I'm just, just going to say a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, you, you all proved me right in what I said at the beginning. There's a reason that the four of you are, are here today and you're the... Uh, the spokespeople and leaders in your particular areas, and uh, you proved that again today. So thank you. And you took the words out of my uh, mouth, Francis. We agree on far more than we disagree on, uh, and that I, that is uh, evident to me every single day. And uh, my last point is, if we can remember that and try to focus on that, rather than the what keeps us uh, on different teams sometimes politically that would uh, we'd get down these multiple pathways a whole lot faster so on that note I'm going to turn it over to uh, Andrew who's got some uh, questions from the audience but thanks very much uh, all of you I really really appreciate it being part of this thank you thanks Jamie uh, thanks James I hope you're, st you're, you're able to stay around because I have one question for you before we end <laughs> In oh, I thought I was off the hook, Andrew. <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping the toughest for off today. Okay. Um, so let, let, let me okay. just uh, quickly go through the questions that are coming in. Uh, Tim, the first one for you. Uh, you talked about several different pathways to net zero. What are the pathways that the natural gas sector needs? Well, um, we have several fuel options. Uh, we have renewable natural gas, uh, we have uh, hydrogen as an emerging fuel option, we have uh, uh, carbon capture and recovery technologies uh, as a means to pull emissions out of the fuel at the end of the stream, we have a host of integration technologies uh, of gas and electricity which deliver net reductions, so there, there are a variety of options um, out there and I think again most people just don't know what they are, they just assume that oh, um, you're moving a hydrocarbon through a pipe, therefore you're not part of the future. And I think that that's, um, I, I actually think it's a, it's a fairly dangerous view. And it's one mm -hmm. that the, the danger of it has been demonstrated by what we're seeing happening in Texas right now, um, you know, where we're having a pretty extreme weather event and, uh, and a, you know, a severely threatened energy system uh, is uh, is at risk, and lots of people are going without access to energy, and uh, we don't want that to happen. And that doesn't happen when you ensure that you've got as many pathways as possible. So. Uh, thank you, uh, Bob. For you, you talked about an education task force. What would you like to see it doing? And, yeah. And so. Yeah. So Andrew, it, it would be it, it's a transportation task force, and I'm sorry if there was any confusion, but it's it, it would be like the industry, which would be vehicle manufacturers, the fuels industry, the biofuels industry, also academics, uh, governments, both provincial and federal governments, uh, energy groups, um, and also indigenous peoples. And, and the goal of it is across the supply chain on transportation that we can coordinate all of those changes and all those pathways. For example, electrification of vehicles um, but are you making hybrid or not and what kind of biofuel can you take i can produce e85 ethanol at 85 percent for example but can the cars take it or how quickly can you produce it so to me it's aligning all of the uh, policies at the federal and provincial government on the transportation and all working together to make sure that it's implemented at the right pace at the right time and recognizes both the economy and the environment um, and that will be the goal of that transportation task force Okay, thank you. Uh, Kim, you seem to be in agreement with that. Uh, do you think there's uh, a lot of room, a lot of need for that? 
Well, I think I think sometimes we have tasks task forces and without clear direction and clear sort of you know outcome intentions we kind of get lost I, I was actually participating on something called real jobs real recovery task force that some of you may know that just wrote a fairly large report to the government and and it was on natural resources and how natural resources will play a huge part in the recovery from COVID-19 and how frankly they are you know so important to our economy and it, it was a very clear um, specific task force so I think task forces when they have the right elements and the right uh, um, framework can be extremely effective and and to Bob's point we have to look at and I think everyone's point actually we have to look at all of those things that would intersect with that transportation what does that look like okay yeah thank you C certainly having a clear set of directions is important um, Francis question for you with regard to the increase of uh, uh, the usage of electric cars what needs to happen well uh, I mean that, that electric cars is, is is one piece of the bigger picture but yeah specifically with respect to to electric cars I think we're probably not too far out from a from that inflection point where uh, you know electric vehicles uh, start um, um, uh, coming close to uh, and eventually cost less than an internal <laughs> combustion engine. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, I, you know, we, we want to continue to um, sort of f facilitate the infrastructure that will be required. It's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. Um, do we have enough infrastructure so that people have confidence to buy electric vehicles? Are we selling enough electric vehicles right now to support the infrastructure? Uh, and so we're, we're still, I think, just shy of that point. But I mean, the, the two big issues for electric vehicles are the cost. Uh, and then when you look at the, you know, sort of the full life cycle cost of, of an EV, it's only now slightly more than internal combustion um, uh, car, number one. Number two is, is range anxiety. Speaking as somebody who lives out in the country, Range anxiety has, you know, has been an issue that I think of, and that one's being uh, addressed as well. So I think we only have a, a, a scant couple of years to kind of get us over that hump, so that uh, so that we've got, um, uh, you know, a sufficient number of vehicles and a sufficient amount of infrastructure uh, out there to to uh, to uh, to support those vehicles. And is it easier to make the case or or to put in place electric vehicles when it comes to public transit? Well, I, I mean, depending upon where you are, um, um, you know, a lot of public transit is, is electric now, right? I mean, yes, we're starting to see uh, more buses moving into, into that space, but, uh, you know, our, our rapid transit systems uh, in, in urban areas are, are, are uh, mostly electric. Uh, in most jurisdictions, you know, where I, where I come from in Montreal, it's they're in the middle of now converting all of it to to fully electric. Uh, but yeah, those are those are separate and different tracks. Uh, although you know the impact in the end from a, a GHG emission standpoint will will both be very much impactful. Okay, here, here's a, a rather big question, but I'll, I'll ask for any quick answers you've got to this. Um, what is the most important discussion on energy in Canada that we are not having today? I'll jump in on that one. Um, right. uh, I think reliability. Um, I think it's I think it's very easy to talk about what an energy system of the future is going to look like without any sense of just how extraordinary the reliability of the current system is and how we take that for granted. Um, I remember a meeting with a with a minister of the crown who shall remain nameless who said, Tim, why am I meeting with you? I have problems and uh, natural gas delivery is not a problem. Uh, part of the reason it's not a problem is because it's incredibly reliable. Um, and if we start tinkering with the energy system in ways with new technologies, uh, uh, speculating with what the energy system of the future can look like, we got to make really, really sure that we're going to guarantee the reliability of that system because we don't want situations like Texas um, or what's happened in California or Australia or several other places to happen uh, to us, um, uh, especially given our climate. So I'd say reliability. And, and given, and given uh, uh, climate change and natural disasters, we're going to have more of these situations that we have to be concerned about, right? Well, whether or not we are, but you know, uh, extreme weather events across North America, overwhelmingly, when you look at the impact they've had, you see that the natural gas system has continued to deliver through them. 
So yeah. you should be asking yourself, all right, um, are our energy delivery systems capable of, of weathering these events? And which ones are most capable? Those are the ones we, at the very least, we want to make sure we're not talking about getting rid of them. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Kim. So, I, so yes, I don't think anybody should talk about getting rid of anything at this point. But I, I would just take and sort of, yes, the natural gas system um, is robust and we rely on it significantly. But the imperative of climate change is something that if we don't address, that's not necessarily going to be the case. And because we're losing our shorelines, because we're losing, we're having severe weather events, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, like I said earlier, the two have to be integrated the addressing of climate change and our energy systems. And it's not that you pick one or the other, you figure out what the best path forward is, understanding what um, the tools are that we have, the geography that's there, all of those things. And, and I think we know now, right now, what we have won't get us to 2050. It will not get us to net zero 2050. So what else do we have to do to get us there? And when we answer that question, and I think we're beginning to, then we have the answer. Uh, Bob, quick thoughts from yeah. you on, on, on issues we, we're not talking about. Open and transparent conversation about all the pathways, not not siloed mm -hmm. key winners. I think we all mm -hmm. need to sit down together, either on the transportation or electricity or the whole energy sector. It's pretty big, but to me, it's you know, we talk about the potential of every single future pathways uh, in an open and transparent way, both on the reliability, Tim, on the environmental benefits, on the cost, affordability of energy. I think it all needs to be put together. Right now, we're having single conversation about hydrogen versus this versus that versus that, and I think we need to put it together. Okay. Thank you, Francis. Yeah, very quickly, I, I, I think the, the conversation that we, we are not having, but should be having, is about uh, regulation and how we're regulating uh, the sectors. Um, and, and it's not just about the needs of today, it's about the needs of tomorrow. And it isn't just about um, how we get approval to get things built. That's a challenge in and of itself. It's very difficult to get anything built, but but it's about how um, electricity, well, and gas utilities uh, are able to make the sorts of investments that are going to be required uh, in the in the new technologies and the technologies of tomorrow. We're, we're not having that conversation, and we really need to. Okay, that's uh, that, that's really a, a useful discussion at the end there because. There's been so much talked about uh, so far, and yet so much we haven't. So in, in a sense, you've just set the table for the next webinar where we've got to have these discussions over. Um, I, I'm going to ask uh, James a, a really tough question before we end, unless anybody has a, one quick point they want to make that, that we didn't get to make. You OK? OK. James, a tough question for you. Uh, tell us about your the, the Natural Resources Committee that you chair. What, what are the plans for the committee over the next uh, several months? Uh, very quickly, because it's two o'clock, and I have to—I'm speaking in the house uh, virtually in about five minutes. So, uh, we're on Friday of this week. We're finishing a study on the economic recovery in the forestry sector, which we've been working on for some time, and then that will be followed by uh, starting a new study on critical minerals and associated value chains in Canada. That's going to uh, take us, I think, about six meetings, and then beyond that, we haven't uh, determined yet. Uh, but as I always do, I always uh, I offer to take advice on what we should be looking at from uh, the people that I'm looking at on the screen and others. So if there's other ideas for where you think we should be going apropos of your last question, uh, what we're not talking about, what we should, by all means, let us know. But uh, listen, thanks again, Andrew. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, for for being part of this. Thank you, Tim Egan, Kim Rudd, Francis Bradley, and Bob LaRock. Uh, thank you for your time in discussing the issue. I'll just remind our audience that we've got two more sessions coming up this week. On the 18th, we'll have a conversation with Minister uh, Monsef, who's the uh, Minister for Women and Gender Equality. And on, on, February the 8th, on February the 19th, we have a session on child care with uh, Margaret McCain, David Dodd, Kathy Bennett, and Sharon Fernandez. So uh, thank you so much for being part of today. Uh, be well and uh, take care of each other. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks Thank much. you. So much. Bye, everyone. Bye.